the number one Costa Rica real estate and investment podcast, bringing you experts from all over Costa Rica. Good morning, guys. Welcome to episode 111 of Costa Rica Real Estate and Investments with me, your host, Richard Bexon. Uh, well, basically here from a sunny Costa Rica this morning after a very wet weekend. As you guys know, October is one of the wettest months here in Costa Rica. I personally like it. It reminds me of England. And I also know that in November, the sun is coming as we transition there into the dry season. Today, we're going to be talking with Adam Baker. Uh, some of you may know him uh, from his famous Frog TV YouTube channel. Adam travels all over Costa Rica, showing you kind of what's happening in the world of travel and hotels and tours and tourism here in Costa Rica. He's also the creative director for the NAMU Travel Group. As travel all over Costa Rica uh, and has lived here for over 16 years. So today we're going to be talking about living in Costa Rica and which areas he would invest his money into as well. Uh, I want to say again, a big thanks to everybody that's reached out. Um, you guys are giving some great feedback on the podcast of topics that you'd like to cover where I can cover them. I also will. Uh, and a lot of you are actually helping find land and also build here using, again, the knowledge of over having managed over a billion dollars of luxury vacation sales here to Costa Rica to hotels, vacation rentals and beach areas. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that tourism comes first and then comes real estate. Uh, the reason being is real estate, you know, in the coastal areas is driven by tourism. So all we do is we look at tourism data uh, and that actually, you know, derives where the real estate will be developing over the coming years. So we've got quite a few projects here that we're working on, helping a few people invest into hotels, build hotels, also find their own homes and build homes as well. Uh, and also just investing in the right areas of Costa Rica based on their goals. If you need any help or want any assistance or just want to chat about it, guys, as I said, I've got 15 minutes for everyone. You can contact us info at investingcostarica.com. That's info at investingcostarica.com. But let's get straight into the podcast. Good morning, Adam. How are you doing? Morning, Richard. I'm good. How's it going? Very, very good. From a sunny Costa Rica, even though the weekend was uh, very wet and uh, very English, right? It was a little bit grey. It was actually quite nice. Uh, the hurricane doesn't quite touch us, usually in Costa Rica. And today is like sunny. You wouldn't know it. Uh, yeah, that's your typical low season, uh, green season weather. It's incredible because sometimes in October, actually, we get a week or two weeks, you know, especially in Guanacaste, the driest part of the country in the northern part. We sometimes get a week or two weeks where there is actually no rain. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, I have I try and, as you know, I travel a lot for work and I try and promote this whenever I'm even just doing live social media stuff. I've been all over the country in the last few months. The weather has been spectacular. People don't talk often enough about the Caribbean in September yeah, and October. Yeah. And when you experience it yourself, proper sunny days not a drop of rain like you say guanacaste and let's be honest you know if you're in the central valley or maybe the central pacific it rains a little bit more in the afternoon but you still get exceptional mornings it's like it's got that it's that weird tint of negative marketing because it's an amazing time of year to be here yeah i mean i agree i mean and, and especially you know when it rains and it stops all the animals come out because they want to yeah. dry off love it even here in the Central Valley, recently my mother-in-law's moved just outside of where she used to be in near Santana. She's already seen a sloth, a howler monkey, frogs in the river. Wow. And this is like 15 kilometers from the center of San Jose. Crazy. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. I mean, that that corridor that runs from Carrara National Park all the way up there to Ciudad Colón and Santana. Yeah. I mean, they get like jaguars and everything in it uh, It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, Anyway, anyway, well, let's talk about, you know, kind of, I suppose, you know, your experience living in Costa Rica. I mean, it's been a crazy few years, you know, but have there been any trends that you've seen over the past years, um, you know, that have like really shocked you? And also, which ones do you think are here to stay? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, the last couple of years has been a bit of a roller coaster. I feel like in the last year it's settled down, but settled down at a new, a new pace, like a new level, especially in the tourism industry. We've been seeing record travel numbers, uh, especially with the travel agency month over month. And I think one of the trends uh, in terms of business, which actually affects uh, possibly your area a bit more, is uh, the, the work from home trend. So employers are now getting more and more comfortable. I've been seeing with employers actually doing great jobs and their lifestyle is improving for being at home, reducing commuting time, re reducing travel. Therefore, they're encouraged to do a better job. This, I think, comes hand in hand with travel. So the more that you have that freedom to work, um, the more you can actually travel and work from abroad and still do a good job, whether you run your own business or whether you're employed. So, you know, you've been talking a lot about the digital nomad visa. I recently saw an ad yesterday, Spain are now extending the, uh, the option within the next couple of months. And this is a trend that I think is happening to a lot of these uh, countries. That's exciting because that means there's going to open the door to a lot more travel. 
employers are still trusting their employees to be incredibly efficient and they're doing a great job. And I think two years of that pandemic has meant that a lot of employees know the value of having a job. Many people, yeah. especially here in Costa Rica, as you know, either lost their job or their salaries were slashed by 75%. So people want to do a great, a great job. So the trend of uh, of uh, yeah, working from home, traveling more, digital nomad visa for sure. I've also noticed I've been speaking on my travels. You know, sometimes you speak to a lot of Uber drivers. I like using an Uber in the Central Valley here. And a lot of them associated with local low level tourism. Now, low level tourism, still a lot of people say they haven't seen as many of the travelers who don't spend as much. But on the flip side, the, the three, four, five star high end luxury traveler seem to be coming down on mass which is yeah. one of the reasons our agency have done exceptionally well. So that that's interesting to see a new type of traveler. Uh, obviously, since the pandemic, more people are traveling because I'm sure they want to get out. So, I mean, it's exciting moving forward. The question is, how long will that bubble of large travel influx remain? Um, but I don't see the the uh, the, the trend of, uh, of a digital nomad visas and extended travel, living abroad, working. I don't see that changing anytime soon. Yeah. I think the next 10 years could be, could be quite interesting. Yeah, it's funny that you say that about the digital nomads, just because there's been quite a few groups here in Costa Rica that have really started to, you know, cater to that. Selena Hostels, you know, was around yeah. prior to the, um, you know, prior to uh, the pandemic, but they, you know, they were ahead of the, I suppose, a curve there. But we've started to see like Habitas, you know, those guys are moving into Santa Teresa uh, and they're moving, they're looking at doing other investments here in Costa Rica. You know, we've got uh, the Mama Rosa and Outpost in Osado. I mean, it, it just continues to be a trend and I don't think that trend's going away. Because I've said is that like, you know, a lot of people used to work to basically retire at 65 and then go and travel and live the dream. I think what's happened yeah. now is that that's kind of smashed together and you have these people that are like, wow, you mean I can work and travel at the same time? Exactly. And, uh, and this is happening earlier. You might be 50s and now 40s or even couples in their 30s, even with kids. Even yep. if you have one or two kids, you now consider the possibility of moving out. We we have a new a few employers at, at the travel agency who've come down, making the move from the States and realizing it's more manageable. Yeah. You mentioned quite an interesting couple of locations. In terms of trends, I've seen a lot more interest uh, search traffic on the whole Nicoya Peninsula, Santa Teresa, Nosada, Samara, specifically Carillo, whether that's, whether that's, you know, the famous, it was, you know, known for yoga, you know, for surfing, a bit more relaxed in terms of the more all-inclusive stuff, the larger resorts in Guanacaste and the more tropical vibe down in the Central Pacific. So that's interesting. And then the question will be, you know, will the government here open the infrastructure up to get there, which is sometimes an issue in terms of the roads. I'm going for a no on that one. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, who knows, Not right? anytime soon. Um, but it's, it's exciting to see the, the hotels and the Salinas of the world and the extended rental options cropping up here. Yep. But yeah, yeah, that one for, that one for sure. I just wonder what the future holds for those locations, Adam. And the reason that I say that is we've seen it in areas before where, you know, you've seen these big, it's cool, it's vibey, you know, the Santa Teresa and Osado, it was kind of, you know, maybe you could refer to that as the, God, I mean, what would be the best one to really compare that to? I mean, the Tamarindo, you know, 20 years ago, um, you know, and now Tamarindo, I mean, Tamarindo does not have a luxury hotel, right? Yeah. Like it's a, a good high-end point. luxury hotel. Uh, no, that's true. Tamarindo Diria, you're looking at four stars it's with not. a lot of 200 plus rooms in it. Cala Luna, Capitan Suizo, but, but like They're all boutique, the, yeah. the, the, what's the most, even a boutique luxury hotel, like what's the most expensive hotel in Tamarindo? Yeah, you spend Cala Luna? bucks a night, max, even for a large suite. And Cala Luna's model looks at two and three bedroom villa rentals near the beach. Yep. It's a good point. I mean, one of the reasons Tamarindo, I mean, many of you viewers might know Tamarindo increases from, you know, a 500 local population to above 5,000 and more so in, in the high season. It's crazy influx. But a lot of these areas, are, again, uh, kind of restricted to their location. They have really good access and roads to Liberia International Airport. When you ask about how long will that bubble continue in the Nosada Samara, uh, it's a great question. Punta Islita, one of the first luxury boutique hotels, opened, what, 30, 35 years ago, first infinity edge in the country. And one of its highlights was it's completely isolated. You were mainly flying to the Islita airstrip. Now, obviously, that's it's still semi, semi isolated. But the question is, if they don't improve the infrastructure, and does this die down in the next couple of years with that interest? I think maybe we'll talk about it later about the culture of living here. But if you're coming here for the first time, and you've never really been in the country. It might change your feeling after 12, 24 months, after one or two years. And then you might need that. You get that need yeah. or that urge to travel again or go back out. And if you are being if you're more isolated, 
then maybe you don't have some of those comforts of home or where you've originally come from. Yeah, maybe it's just that kind of like I love the cool, like I loved Santa Teresa. I loved Nosada. I don't enjoy going there as much anymore because, you know, it's just, it's a mess, man. You know, it's just over development, you know, people building without permits, you know, more kind of in the Santa Teresa than Nosada. Um, it, and insecurity becomes, you know, it becomes an issue. So my question here is that when does that shine, you know, really stop to shine so much? You know, and that's always my concern in those areas that have seen those huge ups. And that's been probably the biggest, you know, growth in, you know, pricing that I've ever seen in Costa Rica in Santa Teresa. And I said, I don't think I've ever seen that in another destination before. Yeah. My question here is, is that like, at what point is it not cool anymore with the cool kids? And what becomes the next cool destination? Because I'm always looking for that next cool destination. Yeah, for sure. Really interesting point and great question. And uh, talking openly. You know, I've got a couple of colleagues here. I work in the film industry or the, the videos, the video world. And Santa Teresa, more than a couple of occasions, have had issues with crime, petty theft. But for yeah. a lot of locals, it's not petty when you're getting your camera or your laptop stolen. When yeah, it can't yeah. be governed, when their infrastructure doesn't exist and the municipal, uh, the municipality in the region don't have enough uh, cops to look after the area and, and you're growing exponentially at a, at, a, at a rate that you cannot control, it becomes an issue, I, I think, pretty quickly. And if you're an investor as well, and you're not actually in the country to deal with the weekly issues or the monthly issues, that also is going to become an issue with you. Because you're wherever you're going to be based, you're going to be on the phone having to deal with whoever might be renting or living in your, your apartment or your, your house. As for the next area, you know, I have a similar feeling myself for Manuel Antonio. When I first came to the country, what, 16, 17 years ago, Manuel Antonio was a really incredible park. You could go in, you see a lot of wildlife. And now they've 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 fixed it. It's lovely to walk in, but it's just slammed. And then, you know, the wildlife doesn't act as it's supposed to. And you come out and obviously there's a lot of sellers trying to sell you their wares and whatnot. But it definitely feels different in the same way that you describe an over overpopulation, maybe to a degree in the region of Santa Teresa. And yeah, as for the new area, well, you know, as you know, in Osa, you've got the Hilton looking at, uh, at their new property, Botanica, down there. It's obviously a lot more isolated in its proper nature. You're not going to exploit Guanacaste anymore. Um, no. Great question. I mean, I had, an, I had an amazing couple of days shooting recently in, in Puerto Viejo. But during the last few weeks of rain that we've had here in Costa Rica, it opens up the issue of road infrastructure. So getting yeah. to the Caribbean still remains a problem. So investing there and actually being somewhat isolated and not having easy access back to the city. It's a great question. I'm not sure. You mentioned earlier between Santa Ana, uh, Atenas and the highway. It's still a beautiful region. There's a very nice highway, still has its issues. But perhaps I don't necessarily know if that's a new issue or a new a new area, a new yeah. gold mine, but it's it's a good option. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's I mean it really depends on what someone's goals are because I think if it's, you know, it's about living, you know, then I, I think that along the 27 certainly is a great location. I think if it's about investment, you know, the beach destinations will always win just because again, you know, that's where the demand is, you know. And I think that people just need to understand is that like, look, it's either access you know, quick access to an airport with road infrastructure, or, you know, are you going to go for a longer term play, you know, potentially in an area that's a little bit more off the beaten track, but feel feels authentic, you know, because people are looking yeah. for that authenticity and rawness. Yeah, no, always. And I think it depends on what your investment plans are. If, if it's to actually invest in a house to rent long term for a family coming in, or maybe a six month or a 12 month to somebody looking for digital nomad, that's very different to looking for an Airbnb style where you're entering, where you, where you are renting it out every other week. Yeah. And then it needs more maintenance because uh, yeah, you need that. If you're going to be there long term, you need the safety issue. But if you're just coming in as a family, it may, might not be so, so, so much of an issue when you're traveling for a week. Um, I guess you have to play those those two against them against each other. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, and how long will it last? Plus, I, I would I'd be interested to get your feedback. How how much do you think uh, negative marketing would play on such an investment? Say you get an issue, people talk about the park being over you know overpopulated or there's petty theft in Santa Teresa. Is yeah. that really an issue? Do you think that is there's enough on social media or really doesn't? No, I think I think they're very valid issues. I mean, again, you know, entrances to parks is very limited. You know, they'll just limit the amount of tickets going in, which I know that they do in Mamon Antonio and a certain number of people. I mean, you know, Mamon Antonio, just taking that one specifically, you know, is the number one visited national park in Costa Rica. So, I mean, not sure whether that's a good litmus test for, you know, where it could go, but they'll just limit entrances. But like the other parks, like you go to Carrara, there's not that many people in it. 
you know, you go to the Parque La Mestad, which is way down south. Nobody's sure. ever in that. Braulio yeah. Carrillo, not tons of people. Santa Rosa National Park. You know, Palo Verde is, is, is quite well visited, but it's not that well visited. Rincon de Viejo as well. So, yeah. I mean, I think that, yeah, Mamon Antonio, just because of the destination it is, you know, is, is I mean, it, you know, they'll just limit entrances there. Um, when it comes to security here, you know, I mean, I always say to people is, look, I mean, it's opportunistic crime here. If you leave a laptop or something in the back of your car, yeah. you know, that's what happens. But like, yeah. People aren't kidnapping you. Like it's not. It's all oh, no. opportunistic. You know, yeah. it's small. Well, we, we wouldn't there. be here if it was seriously unsafe. Yeah. I mean, it's the most yeah. one of the safest countries in Central America, but quite quite some mile. And like you said, always opportunistic. So a lot of these stories I hear from friends and colleagues. Oh, you know, my laptop was in the back seat of a car. Yeah. You wouldn't be doing that in Liverpool or London or New York if you parked yeah. on the side road. So why do it here? Why do it here? That's just sensible yeah. traveling. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's a good point. I mean, let's just touch on a topic here. I mean, what are the top things that you like about living in Costa Rica? Great question. I mean, I'm, I'm approaching 17 years now in January, well, coming over in 2006. Uh, it was like a post-university gap year for me. So interestingly, my story wasn't that I planned on coming, but coming at 21, I really loved the culture. I didn't necessarily have a job to go back to immediately after uni. So instead of getting on the flight, I stayed here and kind of found my way after working you know in the cloud forest a year and a half and then and then beginning in tourism in in, 20, in 2008 i i i happen to love uh, generally the people i eat the, sim the 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 simplicity of life you know as as a foreign expat coming over here you've always you always seem to have less headaches whenever i speak to family and friends back home they're always managing something one of the i guess it's pros and cons right of a first world nation is the amount of things you have to deal with council tax and revenue tax and family or et cetera, X, Y, Z. Over here, it's a little bit easier, you know, whether you're renting, whether you're owning, you know, you have a couple of bills each month. I personally love my job. And obviously that makes, uh, makes a massive difference. You're happy in your job, right? You never work a day in your life. So, you know, and after so long, I've been very established. It does help to speak the language because um, you can, you can uh, assimilate into your community so much easier even if you don't, Costa Ricans have such a great level uh, of English in most cases. But yeah, I mean, it's a simpler way of life. It's less stress. I love the extreme weather. Sometimes it's actually heaving it down with rain. And then you've got this amazing sunshine. You've got this beautiful, you know, uh, spine of mountains in the country. I love cold weather, the cold climates. There's great hiking. I I'm an outdoors person. Uh, I love my sports. So here in the Central Valley for me, I'm very connected to the things I love. And, you know, it's not that far away from the UK for me. So it's getting easier to fly back to Europe with multiple connections, direct flights to London and so on. So it's the simplicity of it. And I feel very lucky that I found this in my early 20s when many people were considering retiring in their 50s and 60s. So just by luck of life, I've got here, you know, 40 years sooner than many. Yeah. And, uh, and honestly, when you look at the news and you look at the rest of the, the current climate around the world, Costa Rica has less issues day to day, things that may or may not get you down, you know, one, one, one thing less to worry about. And I'm always grateful, you know, when we look at the pandemic, it didn't affect us massively in the sense of the day to day of, in terms of shutdowns, the way the laws work here. Uh, it definitely affected uh, industry and whatnot. But again, we seem to be coming out of it. And Costa Ricans, they're always they're always positive. They're, they're generally nice, happy people and very yep. family orientated. Something I can't always say about the British. So it's put me in this lovely frame of mind uh, moving forward. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just got a lot going for it. What, what would you like to see improved here? Um, you know, I mean, again, you know, I mean, I think that that, you know, all the pros also have some cons. Um, they do. They do. But yeah, I mean, what would you like to see improved here? I mean, we, we always joke as expats, right, about infrastructure, famous Costa Rica roads, uh, you know, potholes, queues, getting stuff done from a governmental. There's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of red tape, um, whether it is roads or whether, you know, I always joke about going to the bank. You have to at least prepare an hour, two hours of your day. That's got easier in the last 10, 15 years. Um, I guess, yeah, the ability to actually process things and offer more transparency. Sometimes there's so many roadblocks in the way of getting something done, and it takes a long time. You need to learn patience in Costa Rica. And this is one of the important things when moving here, especially if you're if you're taking the big step and you haven't spent a few months here on a tourist visa or six months traveling, that's essential. Because one yeah. of the things that the Pura Vida, pros and cons, you know, ah, oh, you know, the bad roads, whatever, Pura Vida, it's all cool, but it is frustrating. So you, it's not, you're never going to improve that because it's a cultural thing. 
but learning in uh, patience is an absolute necessity. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's difficult to say improve it, right? Because you also don't want to come in as, you know, the expat going in, oh, well, we, we, we know it's so much better and we're moving here. Well, then why the hell did you leave? Just go back. It's like, yeah. you know, you take it with a pinch of salt, the, the pros and the cons. Obviously the roads, but you know, then people will argue it's not necessarily Costa Rican. I used to live in Monteverde in the cloud forest. That used to be a four hour trek. 10 years later, they've paved the whole way up and it's two and a half hours. Things improve. They just take five times longer, you know, and you'll get annoyed. You know, you see the rains in the low season and then you see all these roads falling down and you're like, well, you should have realized this, you know, yeah. who's drawing, et cetera. But otherwise, you know, uh, working space, it, it's the cost of living on the day to day can sometimes be a bit more expensive. You can't necessarily improve the cost of uh, importing foreign products. It would be great if you could, but you understand. The same goes for cars, you know, gas prices, the cost of having a car, buying a car is a lot higher than uh, the States or European markets. So, you know, yeah, I mean, bureaucracy can be a bit of a pain in the ass, but uh, you, take, you, you take it, you know, it's always going to be something, Definitely. right? Definitely. Well, I mean, you mentioned that you like kind of a colder climate there and you've, I mean, I know you've traveled all over Costa Rica. I mean, what are some of your favorite areas of Costa Rica and why? Yeah, I, I love the Central Valley. I, I I used to say for traveling, and I still do, I love the Osa Peninsula. If you want to see Costa Rica in its true raw abundance, you know, proper primary rainforest, 5% of the, uh, the, the world's biodiversity, as they famously say, it's amazing. But not if you're going to live there, for me anyway, without AC and you're sweating in the rainforest day in, day out. Uh, I live here just outside San Jose. And uh, yeah, the Central Valley for me is wonderful. It's, you know, it's about 60 degrees year round, 70 maybe. Uh I love the uh, I love the landscape. I love being in the mountains. I love smelling the pines. You've got access to volcanoes. It's a very beautiful part of the country. And of course, if you're traveling like me, getting to the beaches, you can be there in three, four, five hours at any part of the country. So getting in and out makes it super easy. It's very accessible. And generally, the routes in and out of San Jose International Airport uh, obviously make international travel easier. The only downside to living in some of these beaches that are perhaps far, farther afield such as, uh, you know, maybe the, the Osa Peninsula, even the Central Pacific, uh, the Caribbean side, takes a while to get back to the international uh, international airport. So that's something to consider. And, but and yeah, take me, a domestic flight. Take a domestic flight, just not after two o'clock in the low season. Otherwise, it gets uh, it gets a quite exciting. Bumpy. A little yeah. bit bumpy. But yeah, I mean, a lot of people have never seen these tiny twin engine Cessna flights. I mean, they're amazing. Takes you back to your, you know, your younger I days. Indiana Jones and you're literally there in with the chickens. But yeah, no, it's an amazing experience. But yeah, for me, Central Valley has a lot going for it. <clears throat> and it depends what you like doing, your day to day, you know? That's yeah. Important. Well, talking about that, I mean, if you had to invest, I mean, you were looking to invest money. And may maybe I'll ask you this question, just because it's the one I always ask. If you were to invest, you know, you were to inherit $500,000 and had to invest it into a business or real estate in Costa Rica, what would you invest it in and where? Yeah, great question. I've certainly been watching and editing some of your previous episodes. Uh, for sure, I'm actually thinking about this in the next five years. Not that I've got half a million in the bank, but I will definitely be looking to invest in a in a small three bedroom property. If I had 500k, I would split it into two. I would probably try and get a two bedroom and a three bedroom separately, possibly one inside a residential unit for security and maintenance, and then perhaps a smaller house in a more secure area. Both would be in the Central Valley, and because I live here, they would be then a much much easier for me to manage day to day. So if I had a family and they had issues, I'll actually be able to sort that out. If yeah. they were somewhere further afield next to the beach, I've got to worry about so many more issues, as, as you know, in terms yeah. of climate, uh, salt, everything else. And I would be much further away. I'd probably live in one uh, if it was my own, because I know it's going to hold its value and then gain some. And certainly rent uh, or I might go down the Airbnb option. But personally, that's a lot of work. The day in, day out, the keys, the maintenance. Parts, yeah, uh, yeah so exactly. So I'd much rather have a, a family who maybe is beginning their, their, their stay here. And as I say, split it half and half. I'd probably make, you know, 225000 more or less. You can get some really interesting two or three bedroom options here. I would save $50,000 and probably invest it into some of our charity projects. Uh, we, You and me have been working on some for quite a while. And I see that a, a certain amount of investment with oversight can be very beneficial for some of the kids in the poorer areas that we've worked in. That might go a very long way, you know, maybe a brand new, uh, a, a brand new uh, aula teaching room, um, yeah. a social area, study area, if you can find some land in and around the Central Valley. And I think that's very lucrative. Maybe it's not a great investment in terms of profits in the long run, 
but emotional profits that be you know it's something you're gonna i'm gonna grow up and actually watch and i think that gets very good for mental well-being so i'd probably put a bit of cash there that reminds me i've still got all that soccer uh stuff to give you actually we've oh, got a lot of donations to hand out uh, yeah <laughs> we catch you up on that. exactly we do we do well adam this has been great chatting with you um i think anyone that wants to get in contact with adam uh, or watch his youtube channel i'll put it uh, in the description down here but really pretty really appreciate you uh, taking the time on this monday morning and to chat with us and it's been very insightful i hope so yeah if you have any questions guys uh, send them over richard always a pleasure chatting with you cool man have a good one cheers mate Bye bye. bye. I hope you enjoyed that podcast there with uh, Adam Baker. As you can see, Adam spends most of his time traveling this country, filming uh, tours, hotels, transport, everything here in Costa Rica. It's pretty amazing some of the work that he does here. Uh, so if you want to chat with him at all uh, or get any of his viewpoint or would like to use his services uh, as a creative director here in Costa Rica, if you're producing any videos, uh, photos, those kind of things, uh, you can reach out to him directly there. Remember, if you need any help investing in Costa Rica or advice here, guys, you can contact us, info at investing costa rica.com info at investing costa rica.com uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us if you've enjoyed this podcast please give it a thumbs up five stars guys we really appreciate the support anyway till the next podcast guys have a good one bye the number one costa rica real estate and investment podcast bringing you experts from all over costa rica 